In Path of Exile Crucible, you'll learn about an ancient race of titans who once shaped the primordial surface of Rayclust. In this league, you will earn the ability to forge their power onto your weapons. And what form does that power take? In an iconically Path of Exile way, it's the ability to imbue your weapons with their own passive skill trees. These Crucible trees can have quite an impact on your character build. For example, in addition to the regular mods on this bow, its Crucible tree grants additional physical damage, physical to chaos conversion, the Master Fletcher notable passive, improved grace effect, and level 10 lesser multiple projectiles. While this is certainly a decent tree to get, it's not even the maximum depth and could be even more optimized for your build. In order to forge these powerful trees onto your weapons, you'll need to complete Crucible encounters. There's one in each area. Each encounter takes place at a Crucible Forge. As you approach the Forge, you'll have the choice of which of your equipped weapons you want to focus on. This can include ones on your alternate weapon swap if you want to improve one you're not currently using. After selecting a weapon, you channel it at the Crucible Forge to spawn monsters. The longer you channel for, the more dangerous and rewarding the encounter becomes. As you spawn additional monsters, they combine together to create larger and more fearsome foes that grant even more experience for your Crucible passive tree. Being able to ramp up the difficulty of the encounters is a double-edged sword. While it gives you the opportunity to make rapid progress on your Crucible weapon crafting projects, it comes with significant risk to your character. It's easy to accidentally overwhelm yourself and make an encounter that is too dangerous. Channel carefully and adapt to what your character is capable of. When you first find a weapon, it doesn't have a Crucible tree unlocked. Channeling that weapon at Crucible Encounters will unlock and reveal its tree, as well as allocating the first skill. You can only allocate one skill at each tree depth, so you'll need to decide which path through the tree is best for your build. As you get deeper into a tree, more and more experience is required to unlock skills. The final depths can take quite an investment and can only be found rarely on endgame items, but also have some of the most powerful properties. For example, this wand has two depth 5 skills to choose from. One of them allows all damage from your Freezing Pulse and Eye of Winter skills to poison, and the other allows various brands to be attached to your Summoned Reaper. There are many such modifiers to skills that will enable very interesting build combinations. In addition to all types of weapons, shields can also be empowered with their own Crucible trees. Here's a relatively simple low-level example. It gets a bit crazier as you approach the endgame. Speaking of the endgame, in endgame Crucible encounters, you'll occasionally find igneous geodes, currency items that can be cracked open to reveal a primeval remnant. This is a map-like item that grants access to the Forge of the Titans, the culmination of your Crucible journey. These primeval remnants always generate as rare items. Half of their mods are upsides and half are downsides. The upsides generally increase the rewards of the area or add special crafting options. For example, causing monsters to drop divination cards or magmatic ore, a form of tradable, itemized Crucible tree experience. The downsides are quite punitive compared to most endgame maps. Ideally, you want to find a primeval remnant that is really rewarding upsides alongside downsides you can handle. If you don't think you'll survive a visit to the Forge of the Titans, trade the remnant away to someone else and gamble on cracking open another geode. If you survive and manage to reach the end of the area, you'll find the aforementioned Forge, which allows you to merge Crucible trees on two items together. The way this process works is that you provide two items of the same class. For example, a pair of bows, a pair of shields, or a pair of one-hand axes. One of these items will be melted down and applied to the other, which will keep its regular properties. Their crucible trees will be merged together in an unpredictable way, taking elements of each one. This is a little reminiscent of how recombinators applied to item mods, taking parts of each crucible tree and merging them together, as well as randomly upgrading, downgrading, or mutating skills on the resultant tree. While this process can create some really powerful trees if you get skills you wanted from both items, it can also completely wreck your precious trees, so take care choosing which you risk combining. Also, like recombinators, there are ways to manipulate the system to improve your odds at getting certain outcomes. For example, any skills that have been allocated are more likely to show up in the resultant crucible tree. By default, you can only add Crucible trees to non-unique items, but it's possible to get a mod on the Forge of the Titans map that allows you to imbue a unique item with a Crucible tree, which can then be leveled up via regular Crucible encounters. To combine Crucible trees on unique items together, you'll want to find a crystalline geode and crack it open to reveal the secret higher level version of the Forge of the Titans. I probably shouldn't say too much about it, but it will let you do some interesting things with Crucible trees. 
There's an important thing to note about crucible trees on unique weapons. In addition to being much harder to unlock, there's a special rule about how they can be combined. A unique weapon must be combined with another copy of the same unique weapon to merge their trees together. Because this destroys one copy, getting a good crucible tree on a unique weapon makes it insanely valuable. It may also raise the trade value of all unique weapons by quite a lot, as players sacrifice them trying to create perfect crucible trees. Occasionally, you'll find a crucible passive skill tree with a special skill that indicates that the item will sell to vendors for a specific item in addition to its regular sale price. These vendor skills usually occur relatively deeply in the tree, so take some effort to allocate, but usually don't block skill choices you'd make when leveling the item up for use. The presence of these skills presents you with an interesting choice about whether you want to use the item or sell it to a vendor, and whether you want to spend your crucible experience either revealing new trees to hunt for good skills, leveling up items to use, or leveling up items to sell. Crucible also features its own unique items you can earn. For example, El Abin's Visage, a unique helmet, is special in that it's the only armor piece other than shields that can receive crucible passive skill trees. Wearing it allows you to double down on certain properties that are only available through these trees. There are several other unique items exclusive to Crucible for you to discover in this league. Crucible is a dual combat crafting league with a focus on encounter difficulty scaling and deep weapon customization with a power level that we have never seen before. Without a doubt, some of Path of Exile's most powerful weapons will be forged in Crucible. We can't wait to see what you manage to create. Like all recent Path of Exile expansions, Crucible includes a lot of changes with the goal of improving Path of Exile's endgame. One area we wanted to address was mobility on the Atlas passive tree. Often, you'll find yourself in a situation where you want to specialize in leagues that are on entirely different sides of the Atlas tree. Or maybe you want to focus on the type of altar that isn't near the leagues you have picked. To solve this, Path of Exile Crucible introduces Atlas Gateways. These are nodes that you can allocate on the Atlas tree that allow instant travel between two locations. There are three pairs of gateways, each allowing travel from the left side of the tree to the right side, or vice versa. Each end of the gateway consumes one Atlas skill point to allocate, but will potentially save you large amounts of travel points. In this expansion, we're targeting a couple of endgame leagues that have fallen behind other leagues on the Atlas tree. Let's start with Breach. In the live version of Path of Exile, there are five tiers of Breachstone. In Path of Exile Crucible, we're raising the area levels of Breachstones to a much higher baseline level. 81 for Elemental Ones, 82 for Physical, and 83 for Chaos. Now that the regular Breachstones are much higher level, we have retired, charged, enriched, and pure Breachstones. They will be converted to regular ones. We have also changed how flawless breach stones are acquired. Previously, you could only get them from Maven invitations, but we prefer access to the hardest breach content to actually come from playing breach. Now there are two ways to get flawless breach stones, through blessings, which are now rarer as a result, and through a skill on the Atlas tree. We've also improved the pacing of breach encounters. Previously, breaches felt pretty good early on, but quickly tapered off in density to the point where you wanted to abandon the breach because it just felt like not enough monsters were spawning. Our changes now keep breaches feeling dense throughout, leaning more on the side of it feeling overwhelming towards the end of the breach. We have also reduced the duration of breaches so there is constant monster pressure and you can get on with your mapping sooner. There are a whole bunch of other breach changes that you can read about in the patch notes, such as changes to the Betrayal Research Safehouse, Breach Scarabs, Breach Stones from Kirik Missions, the Breach Harvest Crafting Option, the Fragment Stash Tab, Divination Cards, Breach Unique Items, Atlas Passives, and so on. We're also revamping Abyss in a similar way. Abyssal Depths now always contain an Abyssal Lich. Previously, the prevailing gameplay was to check the loading screen art of an Abyssal Depths to see if it contained a Lich, and bail out if it didn't. Now, the Depths always contain a Lich, removing the need for this step. While the rate of encountering Abyssal Liches is unchanged, Abyssal Depths are rarer than before. However, Abysses now have a chance to spawn a Stygian Spire in place of their reward chest, which will drop all of the jewels and other items you'd normally receive, as well as a Stygian Vice. In addition, you're guaranteed to always get a four-hole Abyss alongside your Abyssal Depths. Previously, Abyssal Depths could only spawn immediately after a single Abyssal Hole, which prevented you from getting full value from the Abyss. The Lightless Legion notable passive has been replaced with a new skill which grants Stygian Spires in your maps drop items with plus one to item level. This is intended to allow players to continue to be able to obtain item level 86 Stygian Vices and other base types as a reward for specializing in Abyss. The small passives leading up to this notable passive have also been replaced. 
We've done a balance pass on Abyssal Lich encounters to make them more appropriately difficult relative to the current standard of endgame encounters. Abyss Uniques have had some balance attention also, and the details are in the patch notes. Overall, these changes should ensure you can play a wider variety of leagues in the endgame, both through being able to access them more easily and because Breach and Abyss now feel far more modern and competitive with other popular league content. A big goal of the Crucible expansion is to provide a lot of new ways to build characters and to breathe new life into older builds. To achieve this, we're doing two things. Firstly, we have created many more interesting options for one of Path of Exile's core build systems, the passive skill tree, by overhauling many of its masteries. Secondly, we have revamped two specific ascendancy classes. As we reviewed the masteries on Path of Exile's passive skill tree, we realized that a lot of the choices were rather bland and could be a lot more exciting. We went through the masteries one by one and tried to come up with as many interesting stats as we could, ignoring what was currently there. Once we had a short list of high quality stats, we added in the existing ones that used to be on each mastery and picked the six best. All of the leftover ones have been saved for later or used in places like unique items. This process was performed on approximately half of the masteries on the tree, initially targeting the ones that needed the attention the most. Previously, some masteries only had four options, so we've tried to increase as many as possible to six options. We've also added a couple of new mastery types that we felt were missing. Let's look at an example, the life mastery choices. You can see some of the interesting new options, such as the ability to manipulate your low life and full life thresholds, which allows you to more effectively use the damage while on full life support gem and many unique items. Getting a large increase to maximum life when you have no life on your body armor not only works really well with a whole lot of unique items, but also opens up new prefix composition options for rare body armors. Here you can see the armor and energy shield mastery has more options available than before. The other thing we focused on with this one is tying the mechanics together better. Instead of some being about armor and some being about energy shield, we've tried to make sure each really emphasizes having both armor and energy shield. On the Leech Mastery, we've combined the three increased life mana and energy shield recovery stats into one choice that affects all of them. The space we've freed up has been used to add some powerful new options, such as a portion of your Leech applying instantly. The Spell Suppression Mastery also has many interesting options. Your chance to suppress spell damage becoming lucky is extremely useful before you've optimized your gear and haven't reached 100% yet. The third option rewards you for stacking more than 100% spell suppression, which previously had few benefits. Now it's something you can plan your itemization around. While looking at masteries, we noted that there were some mechanics that didn't have enough passive tree support, so we decided to add some more options and passive skill choices for those mechanics. We also wanted to grant more access to certain types of masteries in specific parts of the passive skill tree. For example, in order to allow more access to the attack mastery, we've added an attack cluster by the Templar, and one between the Ranger and Shadow. We wanted to create more access to other forms of recovery, such as regen and recoup, so we've added some new passive skill clusters. Note that there is now a new mastery called recovery. We've also added more capacity for investment in certain mechanics that we felt could be improved, such as link skills, stun mitigation, and marks. These mastery improvements and passive tree changes are just some of the ones introduced in Path of Exile Crucible. We look forward to your feedback on the rest when you check out the passive skill tree next week. While going through Ascendancy classes, we identified two that needed work, the Saboteur and the Pathfinder. Both have been significantly changed in Path of Exile Crucible. These changes reinforce their respective identities while adding some new options to build around. The Saboteur is definitely the Ascendancy class most aligned with traps and mines but the old version of the Saboteur made it difficult to play anything but traps or mines. The new version has more builds available, including a whole new specialization, Triggers. There are two notable passives that help with this. Like Clockwork grants you the increased cooldown recovery rate stat, which is a pretty rare one. This is great for triggered spells as it indirectly increases their damage. This notable also makes your enemies have longer cooldowns, which can be useful in certain boss fights, for example, causing the Maven's memory game to occur less often. The Perfect Crime notable passive summons two trigger bots, which override the location of where a triggered spell is being cast, and instead causes it to trigger twice, once from each of their locations. The layout for the Saboteur's Trap and Mine Ascendancy passives has changed, so that there aren't separate four-pointers for traps and mines. Now each one has a two-pointer that is connected to the same shared four-pointer. We have also completely reworked Bomb Specialist to be specifically tied to area damage, so it's a slightly more general skill. 
It both gives you some area damage as well as some defense against incoming area damage against you. The Pathfinder has been overdue for some attention, especially with recent features such as concoction skills that she could get the ability to specialize in. We also wanted the Flask theme to center seat to have a proactive way of improving life flask usage. Master Distiller allows you to turn most of your skills into concoction-like effects. Master Surgeon now effectively gives all of your life flasks the enduring effect, previously only found on mana flasks. Finally, both of the major flask theme branches now have some form of flask charge recovery. There are other improvements to the Pathfinder Ascendancy, such as Nature's Reprisal, now interacting with Wither to improve all forms of your chaos damage, rather than just attack forms of it. Check out the full details in the patch notes that we'll be posting after the livestream. Path of Exile Crucible introduces nine new Val skills. Last expansion, there was an emphasis on melee Val skills. In Crucible, we're making sure that many other types of builds get new skills to build around. Val skills let us introduce quite powerful effects that we couldn't normally give to a regular skill that can be used constantly. They also implicitly act as a buff to the underlying skill. Val Absolution upgrades one of your Sentinels of Absolution into an Apparition of Innocence. You can only have one Apparition at once, but just check out these massive AoE skills it uses. Val Arctic Armor instantly encases you in ice, preventing non-instant actions including movement, but granting massive damage reduction against hits. After a short duration, it also starts to regenerate your energy shield and mana at a fast rate. Both the damage reduction and regeneration last for a few seconds, or until you have been hit three times. It cannot be manually cancelled. Because the skill is instant, it's a great emergency button against dangerous boss slams, but also makes you count as being frozen, despite Arctic Armor normally making you freeze immune. Having another way to self-freeze may be of interest to a few mad scientist build creators in the community. Val Lightning Arrow fires a barrage of piercing projectiles that cause lightning to strike nearby targets whenever they hit an enemy. After a short amount of time, or when they collide with terrain, their arrows randomly change direction and continue flying. This occurs a number of times before the arrows expire. Each arrow can hit the same target once per redirect. Because the arrows travel for a set time before redirecting, rather than a set distance, projectile speed modifiers affect the distance traveled. High projectile speed lets you clear out huge areas with them, while reducing your projectile speed increases the chance of them hitting the same target multiple times. With very low projectile speed, the skill can hit a single target 20 plus times. Val Reap conjures a ring of scythes that deal damage to all enemies in a circular area. The scythes leave behind a pool of blood that deals heavy physical damage over time to enemies standing in it, and for a short duration after they leave it. Val Reap instantly grants a large number of the blood charges used by normal Reap on use, as well as temporarily higher maximum blood charge capacity, substantially powering up the regular version of the skill. Path of Exile Crucible introduces five other Val skills we'll reveal over the next week. Val Animate Weapon, Val Domination, Val Ice Shot, Val Rejuvenation Totem, and Val Firestorm. This expansion also introduces more than 10 new unique items. There are three in particular I'd like to show you today. Blood Price is a unique helmet that has a new effect, reserving enemy maximum life. This does exactly what it implies, causing nearby enemies to start at 92% maximum life. While this increases your clear speed against all enemies, it's especially useful against bosses. The helmet's drawback is that it reduces your maximum life, but provides decent life regeneration and block and stun recovery to counteract this. Tainted Pact is an amulet that causes chaos damage over time to heal you while you're leeching life. While the amulet provides a decent amount of life leech itself, it'll certainly require a few tricks to unlock its full potential. Widow Hail is a unique bow that is different from any other bow in Path of Exile. As a weapon, it does basically no base damage and doesn't grant any stats of its own, but it does dramatically increase the power of mods provided by your quiver. Needless to say, this could produce some pretty ridiculous outcomes with good rare or unique quivers. We will reveal some of the other new uniques over the coming week. Ruthless is a game mode that we released alongside the Sanctum expansion late last year. It's designed around extreme item scarcity and is challenging because you're constantly behind the item power curve. So far it has found a very passionate audience of players who love how rewarding item drops feel in such an austere environment. We have some small improvements to Ruthless and Path of Exile Crucible. Firstly, Eternal Orbs are back in Ruthless. These are an extremely powerful currency item that allows you to imprint an item and restore it if you're unhappy with the result of crafting. 
We disabled these game-wide seven years ago because they were far too powerful when combined with all of the different crafting options Path of Exile offered at the time. Ruthless does not have the base game's crafting feature set, so we have enabled Eternal Orbs to drop in Ruthless, albeit extremely rarely. Ruthless now has its own set of challenges to complete. Like the ones in early Path of Exile, there were a total of eight, and they're very difficult. Like we've done in the past, we're hosting a boss kill event at the start of the Crucible Challenge League. It'll be held in Ruthless Hardcore Solo self Out, and will require you to kill both the Uber Searing Exarch and the Uber Eater of Worlds, making it by far the hardest event we have ever run. The first place winner will get to work with our design team to add a new unique item to Path of Exile. They'll also receive a transferable Ultra VIP ticket to Exocon in July. If they aren't able to attend or already have a ticket, then they are allowed to sell this one as they see fit. Second and third place finishers will receive a transferable VIP ticket to Exocon that can also be sold at their discretion. If you'd like to enter the event, just create a character in Ruthless Hardcore Solo Cell Found on launch day. Best of luck to everyone. On the weekend of July 29 to 30 New Zealand time, which is July 28 to 29 for much of the rest of the world, we're going to be hosting Exocon 2023 in Auckland, New Zealand. While tickets to the in-person event are very hard to get, we will be streaming the entire event for free. At Exocon, we'll reveal our latest updates on Path of Exile 2, Path of Exile Mobile, and the next Path of Exile 1 expansion. Make a note in your calendar, tell your friends, and don't miss it. The second day of the Path of Exile livestream culminates in a competitive race event between some of Path of Exile's best players. In order to select the four competitors, we're going to run qualifier events during the months of April and May. The winner of each event will receive a VIP Exocon ticket, return flights to Auckland and accommodation, and will compete in the race event live on stage. All four qualifiers in the final event will be run on the 321 version of Path of Exile, which has received a fair amount of early game balance work that will change the racing meta quite a lot. You'll be able to read more in the patch notes. Once 321 releases next week, you'll be able to solve the new meta, practice hard, compete in the qualifier events, and hopefully win your place on stage in July. Alongside Path of Exile Crucible, we're introducing a few new types of microtransactions. An example I wanted to describe today is that of mannequins. These are hideout decorations that you can place to show off sets of microtransactions you have assembled. You can equip them with your spare micros and pose them in various ways. It's also possible to swap your entire outfit with a mannequin's one, which lets you easily store micro sets to be retrieved later. Other new microtransactions coming up include wrapping paper, which lets you gift wrap items to hand to other players, or even drop in town for random people to pick up. Today we're launching two new series of supporter packs, the Lithomancer and Enchanter packs. Each tier contains the pack's full face value and points, alongside several exclusive microtransactions. These packs are only available for the duration of the Crucible League, and will leave the store forever when it ends. As always, the microtransactions in these packs are purely cosmetic and do not affect your character's power or progression in any way. The Lithomancer series of supporter packs contains six exclusive microtransactions. The Tunnel Bear isn't just adorable, he will also take the place of the Crawler in Delves, lighting your surroundings and laying down cables. Apparently, this is what happens when your bear gets into a kilo of sulfite. Might explain what happened to Nico. The Ring of the Demon Slayer attempts to exorcise rare and unique demons when you hit them. The souls of defeated demons are banished to the depths below. The ancient stone of the Lithomancer's armor set crumbles when you take damage, revealing the crimson core inside. The stone reforms if you haven't taken damage recently. A sip from the ancestral granite flask causes a Karui ancestor to appear and surround you in protective wards. The ancestral portal encases you in molten armor when you travel through it. The summoned Karui Ancestor rallies you to battle and honestly seems to have an unhealthy obsession with combat. Go forth and conquer. Ever want to practice running away from volatiles? The gunpowder foot attachment straps explosives to your legs, dispersing lit gunpowder behind you. Be careful, you can only outrun it for so long before it catches up. The Enchanter Pack series also has six exclusive microtransactions. The Parrot of Exile pet parrots your exile. We'll just let it speak for itself. It would be wrong to do that here. Wrong! Wrong! I need more mana. Mana! Wrong! 
Drinking from the bottled storm jade flask encases you in a surging tornado, churning up the ground in your wake. If you stand perfectly still while wearing the enchanted armor set, it will attract butterflies to flutter around you. Be careful not to disturb them. Sick of high-fiving giant purple appendages? The Ritualist's Breach Ring visually transforms breaches you find into occult summoning circles. The Enchanter's Crafting Bench replaces the normal crafting bench in your hideout with a suite of tools fit for a master artisan. The various crafting stations burst into life as you use them. If you've ever wanted to remind your character who's really in charge, the Puppeteer's back attachment has you covered. It truly is the sinister presence pulling the strings. These new packs are available right now at pathofexile.com slash purchase. Purchases like these directly fund the ongoing development of Path of Exile 1 and 2. Meanwhile, the Forge and Gemling packs leave the store forever at the launch of the Crucible League, so now's your last chance to purchase them. Thank you for your continued support.